Welcome to lecture three. What we're going to do in the first part of this lecture is to use our newly found knowledge on power law fluids to explore capillary flow. Much in the same way that we did the analysis for a Newtonian fluid, where we're presupposing a rheology and trying to get rheological parameters from experimental measurements, we're now going to look at how we can do a similar workflow for a power law fluid. The analysis is, is fairly similar. The only thing is the mathematics is slightly more complicated and it's very easy to lose track of fractions. So that's, that's the warning I would give to you now is pay careful attention to fractions and powers. When we've established what the result is for a power law fluid, both in terms of velocity field and volumetric flow, we'll see how we can check to make sure we've got the right result and also we'll see what it means in terms of heat and mass transport properties, in terms of pressure drop, and in terms of the nature of the velocity field that we actually get within our pipe. So, let's start by examining the force balance that we looked at in a previous lecture. So there we are on the blackboard, it's a hopefully familiar force balance. What we have is an element of a pipe, at the core of that flow we have a little element of fluid, a cylindrical element of fluid, and we're looking at the forces acting on that cylindrical element. Note that upstream we have a greater pressure than downstream, and we have a shear force acting around the periphery. We've seen how to do this force balance before, so we're not going to go through all of that force balance again. We'll jump straight to the result, which is that we know that that shear stress around the periphery, and again, if we were to be particular, we would say, well, this is on the radial face acting in the Z direction, so tau R Z strictly, we'll just call it tau for now, is going to be a function of radius, and it's equal to little r, which is the radius of my element that I'm examining, over 2 delta P over L, which is my pressure drop per unit length. So, if you recall what we did for the Newtonian fluid, we looked at tau and said that using our constitutive law, we can relate tau to rate of deformation. For the Newtonian fluid, it was tau equals mu du by dr. Now, here we have the power law fluid, again, on the blackboard, which is written slightly differently. So we know tau of r equals k gamma dot to the n. Furthermore, we know that k gamma dot to the n is k du by dr to the power n, which is simply equal to r over 2 delta p over l. So, what we're going to do now, as before, is to get that equation, assume that we have no-slip boundary conditions, and remember the warning about no-slip boundary conditions. It's something that you're habitually used to using at the moment, but it's something that you may need to question in flows of complex fluids, for reasons we'll explore in later lectures, but we'll assume that no-slip exists, and we will integrate to find our velocity field. So there on the blackboard, in brackets, just on the top left, you've got a reminder of what the expression is that we're integrating. And I've highlighted in the various different colours the terms that appear in the rearranged equation for the velocity field. So the limits we're looking at is between an arbitrary point in the flow and the edge of the flow, little r to big R, where big R is the radius of our pipe. And one integration later, we have the result for our velocity field. Note the form of the expression. This was my motivation for saying, please be careful with fractions and powers. It's very easy to make a mistake, to get a fraction the wrong way up or something similar, which will invalidate your result. Now, if you recall our discussion of our power law fluid, we can say that, look, if we set the power law index n equals to 1, we should get the relationship back for Newtonian fluid. If we think of k gamma dot to the n, if n equals 1, you have k gamma dot, which equals our stress tau. And if k equals mu, our Newtonian viscosity, we can see that that is the Newtonian constitutive law. And so that sanity check applies to any expression that we derive with a power law fluid. So let's implement that sanity check here. If we put n equals 1 in that slightly unwieldy expression, we revert to the form of our Newtonian velocity field, our parabolic flow. Very, very useful check. So the one thing I'd like you to start thinking about now is whenever you have an expression using a generalised Newtonian fluid, 
a viscoplastic fluid and even the more complex viscoelastic fluids, there will be ways to set certain parameters equal to certain values that will yield you a familiar result, usually the Newtonian. Do that as a check just to make sure that you've got things right. So now that we're happy that we have our parabolic flow, we can continue to look for an expression for volumetric flow rate. So there on the blackboard is the form of our velocity field with all those fractions involving n or n over n plus 1 or n plus 1 over n. Remember our volumetric flow is quite simply found by saying look we've got a symmetric flow around the center line of the pipe so at a given radius out from that center line all around a perimeter at that same radius we're going to have the same velocity. So if we sum up all the volumetric flow rates that result from those velocities at given radii, we result in the volumetric flow rate. So there on the second line on the blackboard, we have our volumetric flow rate Q is 2 pi r, radio, the um, length of our periphery, times dr is thickness, so that's an area, multiplied by my velocity at that point. So 2 pi r u of r integrated will give us our volumetric flow rate. Note that we're now integrating between 0, the center line of our pipe, and big R, the outer radius. And one integration step yields us the result on the blackboard highlighted in blue there. OK, again, we'll form a sanity check. So if n equals 1, we should get our Newtonian result back. And look, there we do. The Q equals pi big R to the power 4, delta P over 8 L K in this case, but if K was equal to mu, that would be the familiar Newtonian result. So again, a good demonstration of how we can check our results against an established result that we're happy with. Great. So we have a velocity field, we have a volumetric flow. What does this actually mean for us? Let's have a look to start with at the form of what the velocity field looks like. So here on the blackboard now, what I have is a plot of a normalised velocity, which is the velocity at any radius divided by the maximum velocity, so in the middle it's 1 and at the outer edges it's 0, as a function of normalised radius, both going in the positive and negative direction, if you like. So we get the full profile. The curve that's on there at the moment is for setting n equals to 1, which is my familiar parabolic flow for Newtonian fluid. So if n is greater than 1, this is our dilatant fluid or our shear thickening fluid, we can see that we have a far sharper profile, um, almost triangular in shape. Now remember we're plotting normalised velocity here. If we were plotting absolute velocity, the peak flow velocity would be a lot higher than the same volumetric flow of Newtonian fluid. And actually if I presented it in that way, the graph would become very skewed and hard to read, so that's why I've normalised it. So do remember that the peak velocities here are higher, even though I'm plotting normalised velocity and they look the same. So there in red is our dilatant fluid, and now in light blue I have my shear thinning fluid. And it's a lot closer to plug flow. You've got a, a plateau region across the core of the flow and very sharp shear rate gradients as you tend towards the walls. From a numerical standpoint, it's quite interesting because these sharp shear rate gradients actually give us numerical problems if we're writing computer code to solve this. And we have to change slightly how we do iteration procedures, but that's not really part of this course. So this is all well and good. We have changes to our velocity field, as we might expect, as we change n. And we have two broad trends, one for dilatant fluids, shear thickening fluids, or one for shear thinning fluids. Now, as chemical engineers, we often worry about heat transport and mass transport, and we're used to seeing correlations that give us heat transfer coefficients, for example, via a Nusselt number, via flow non-dimensional groups, for example, a Reynolds number, maybe even a Prandtl number. What I've put on the board there is a correlation that gives us a heat transfer coefficient for the flow of a power law fluid. Now there's lots of correlations in the literature that work for generalised Newtonian fluids and the reason why I've put this particular correlation up is to act as a warning because when chemical engineers see a Reynolds number they will automatically revert to the Newtonian form of a Reynolds number, rho dv over mu. Mu 
is the Newtonian viscosity. We're dealing with a power law fluid now. Mu, of course, is not a parameter in a power law fluid. So the key message here is familiar non-dimensional groups change their form when you're dealing with a generalised Newtonian fluid. So the Reynolds number in this case has our density in. It has a d squared term in. It has our velocity raised to 2 minus n. n is our power law index. And in the denominator, we have k, our consistency index. So beware. Let's look at our Prandtl number. And again, we can see within our Prandtl number, we have our Reynolds number featuring raised to powers involving the power law index. So key point here is heat and mass transfer correlations do exist for generalised Newtonian flows. They do change from their Newtonian counterparts and they will be specific to the generalised Newtonian constitutive law that you're using. So extra care required. Let's now have a look at another parameter that chemical engineers are very interested in, and that is pressure drop in a flow. So this graph now on the blackboard, I'm plotting pressure drop in Pascal as a function of volumetric flow rate. And I've put on there the Newtonian result. You can see that beautiful linearity between pressure drop and volumetric flow that we'd expect. Now, what happens as we manipulate N? This, our Newtonian fluid, is N equals 1. If we successively reduce N, we see a wonderful thing happening. It's not very often in nature that increasing complexity actually happens to have a good result for us. But in this case, as an engineer, it does. Because as we reduce our power law index, as our fluid becomes more and more shear thinning, our pressure drop becomes lower, which means that any energy use in, for example, conveying machinery, pumping machinery, extrusion machinery, also gets lower. So this is a really useful result, for example, for polymer processing and other allied industries. So as fluids increasingly shear thin, pressure drop decreases. So let's recap a few points. Remember, for any constitutive law, be it Newtonian or power law, how to derive a velocity field and how to derive a volumetric flow rate. If we think back to the Newtonian lecture on this subject, we said that, look, capillary flows are really important practical rheology flow, and we need to know what our volumetric flow rates are as a function of material parameters. We've derived those two expressions for a power law fluid and seen that the mathematics is very, very tractable, which is not necessarily the case for generalised Newtonian fluids of higher complexity. We've seen that it is possible to check a newly derived expression for a power law fluid or for any other generalised constitutive equation with a Newtonian. For a power law fluid, we set our power law index n equal to 1. Very useful check. We've seen for shear thinning fluids that the velocity profile is quite plug flow, and also that as our fluid becomes increasingly more shear thinning, our pressure drops diminish for the same volumetric flow rate. And the final word of warning is beware non-dimensional groups in heat and mass transport correlations. They change for different constitutive laws.